are now going to deep dive into three key areas that are part of this transition towards a sustainable future. And for those three key areas, we have a similar format. And these are the areas that are the subject of the boot camps this afternoon. So hopefully you've all signed up for a boot camp, you know where you're going. If you don't, any of the wonderful green tech folk will be able to help you. But we're going to deep dive into finance, sustainable communities and energy. Three deep dives, each with a similar format. So we're going to have a keynote speech for all of them. And then we're going to hear from the boot camp host keynote and the co-host pitch. Oh, that's very complicated. I think we'll get the, by the time we get to the third, we'll be fine. Um, but essentially, we're going to bring each of these subject matters uh, to life and hopefully inspire you for the boot camp for this afternoon. And then when we've done all of that, when we're just giddy with this inspiration that we've heard, we're going to hear a final keynote from Paul Polman, who is rather excellent, I should say. So that is the plan, and we should finish, and the timings are so tight, at 13.03. That's how much attention we need to pay to the timings here. And then there'll be lunch. So does that sound all right? Very good. Very good. Uh, you're in the right place? Yes? Marvellous. Right. Issue number one, sustainable finance. Um, and in a way, we've kind of teed up this conversation in the previous panel because we did indeed hear from the previous panellists that money does make the world go round and that finance is a critical enabler for the transition to a net zero economy. And we are now going to um, hear the session keynote, background to the boot camp. Having said that the three issue areas were going to be covered in the same way, that's not strictly true, actually, because we're going to hear a startup disrupt from Sphere yes. Disruptors. Hello, I'm Svea Fina, and I'm the co-founder of Decarbon. Really happy to be here. Co uh, Decarbon is one of the rare startups featured by the Green Tech Festival, so thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to be here and invite you all on our journey. It's a journey through the current climate finance jungle on a mission to change the carbon removal market. How? We are our blockchain solution for high quality carbon credits. Why are we building this? After taking a deep dive on the uh, research back deep dive, I'm a bit excited because it's my first time presenting this topic and this project. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> After taking a, a research back deep dive on carbon climate market in the climate finance market, we know something has to change. To reach our goal to go no global net zero, the shout for disruption is evident. After talking to an immense ama insane amount of companies, we know there is a great demand for, first of all, high quality climate projects, as well as bleeding edge technology. So it's about the quality of the climate projects and the carbon credits as well as the technology. Speaking of, I bet many of you have been faced with the challenge of reducing, offsetting your CO2 emissions. You're not alone. It's topic number one on government's desk and they even committed to increase their uh, commitments in terms of reducing emissions. And second, we heard it also yesterday from Audi, thousands of companies, asset managers, suppliers, want to go net zero by 2050. For instance, our home country, uh, Germany, 2045. What does this all lead to? Basically, carbon markets been, have become the next big thing and are poised for growth. Already in 2030, it will be a $1 trillion market. But there's a problem. It's not running as smoothly as they should, and their integrity has been put into question. Greenwashing and the lack of transparency are key investor and regulatory concerns. This is because the market is characterized by a large number of intermediaries, low liquidity, and inadequate risk management services. 
This led for companies to high transaction costs and low transparency. I mean, we found projects where only 5% ended up in the climate projects. I mean, 5% of the investment spent end up there, and 95% without any positive impact on the climate. Let that think in. We think this shouts for disruption. We want to change that. We want to make sure that the invested dollar end up in the highest climate projects around the world, make the biggest impact. Let me introduce you to the carbon. We believe that by using modern digital technologies like blockchain and the upcoming Web3 rev revolution, we can not only reduce transaction costs, we can create transparency. We want to create an infrastructure which sets consistent standards for carbon credits and carbon removal projects to have a win-win for companies, investors, suppliers, society and the planet. We think that by using and want to make sure that by using our technology that we can provide more transparency, more traceability to the market, we can cut out all the intermediaries and we are building this on a very modern Web3 blockchain solution supervised by the German regulator, Buffin. To sum it up, Decarbon is the solution to increase the value of carbon credits while uh, reducing the transaction costs. So if you're an investor, like, or no, if you're a company trying to buy um, and to, to buy carbon credits to offset to hedge against future uh, price increases, or if you're an investor, talk to us at Decarbon. We're just building the solution. Thank you so much. Thank you. So what I'm loving about this morning is that we're getting to hear some of the solutions that will get us to where we need to be, and that is just another one. Um, so thank you very much for that. So we are now embarking into our deep dive on sustainable finance and we have a session keynote up first and my great pleasure to welcome Cliff Pryor who is the CEO of Global Steering Group for Impact Investment. He's going to tell us a lot more about that initiative, could be a real game changer. Cliff, come and tell us why. Thanks very much, and oh gosh, this is different to a Zoom call. Um, I don't see any cats or children sort of running around. It's, uh, it's quite different. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you for all that you're doing uh, for the future of sustainability. Um, Global Steering Group for Impact Investing. So what we're about is driving forward sustainability and uh, impact uh, across the globe. And we do that by bringing together you know, finance, uh, people from business, people from government and uh, philanthropy, all to drive towards impact economies. And the influence of this is built on a network, a unique growing network of national advisory boards for impact. So there's 33 at the moment, there's another 20 coming along. And they're all working on their own solutions to uh, both climate and social um, uh, challenges. So. Let's look at some of the investment uh, approaches which are going to be relevant for, uh, for this, this work. Um, kinds of investment models. So first of all, in impact investing. So what is that? Investments that have an explicit intention to generate positive and measurable social and environmental impact alongside a financial return. Impact investing assets currently around about one trillion US dollars. So that's, that's that. Examples. What would impact investing actually do? So, for example, uh, off-grid solar energy uh, in emerging economies, education in India, um, social enterprises in the UK. That's what I used to do. Um, uh, Place-based community investment. Uh, a, a really tangible um, set of issues around uh, gender-based investing, ar about uh, racial justice investing. So that's impact investing. What about sustainable investing? So that's an investment discipline uh, that considers environmental, social and corporate factors uh, to generate long-term um, competitive financial returns and 
doing that by reducing risks and harms. So it's not positive impact, it's reducing the negative. What does that all come to? Starting point, of course, is our goals, the SDGs. It's, uh, it's, it's net to zero carbon by 2050. It's the 1.5 degrees limit. That one trillion that we've got of impact investing is going to need many trillions of dollars. So we're going to need to radically uh, remodel our financial system. Now, that isn't the only change that needs to be made, and we've heard already a lot of different changes, hydrogen changes, solar changes, et cetera, et cetera. But frankly, without a financial system that is actually designed towards sustainability, we haven't actually got a chance. We haven't got a chance. So whether that's you know, the, the venture capital for new initiatives, whether it's the um, uh, the equity funds into growing businesses for sustainability or the massive bond uh, funds that are going to be needed to underpin the infrastructure for a sustainable future. Um, all of that is dependent on the financial system being not just sort of as it was and put a little bit on the side, but a system that is actually designed for that future. Now, our single biggest um, uh, initiative this year is a G7 uh, uh, impact task force and that's brought together 120 high-level um, folk uh, BlackRock, Temasek, Schroders, Mahindra Group, Morgan Stanley, S&P Global, ba BASF, World <laughs> Bank, European Commission, IMF, all of that, um, people from every continent and what it's trying to do is to identify the recommendations around harmonization of the standards, uh, it's about impact transparency, so uh, you can see the good and bad that's happening of, uh, in every company and every investor, and integrity to pin that down. And we've heard uh, an example of the kind of integrity that can be used just now. Um, so, and it's also looking at financial vehicles that can, um, can help deliver a truly just transition, a just transition, social and environmental locked in together because we know and we have seen country after country that without social justice, a strong sense of social justice, populations just don't accept the changes that are needed for the environment. So, back to impact. Impact investing started off with uh, very dedicated investors doing small-scale investments into social enterprises. I used to do that. It was probably the most exciting work that I ever did. It's lovely, it's absolutely lovely. Um, as impact investing grew, big asset managers started to create uh, impact funds, much bigger. Uh, that was my last job. Um, less fun, more influence, definitely more influence. And now we're looking to use some of the impact measurement and management tools that we've developed over the last 20 years for, for impact to examine the positive and negative uh, impacts of all investments, whether they intended to do good or not, let's just see what they've actually done, the positive impacts and the negative impacts. Now, why are we doing that rather than just trying to grow impact investing, which we know is intentional for people and planet? It's wonderful. Impact investing is, you know, it does the tough social and environmental challenges. It breaks through new, new areas. It's dedicated to the lives of, of people and, and planet but we've only got one trillion of it, and it's taken us 20 years to get to that. And we know that for the SDGs and for net zero, we need at least $90 trillion. And we're not gonna get from one to 90 uh, in the space of time that's needed. So we need to bring in new actors. ESG finance that I mentioned, sustainability finance, you know, it's, it's risk reduction, not positive intention, but if you put impact measurement and management on it, and you've got this uh, transparency, we believe it will, uh, it will be the next best thing. And there's already 40 trillion of ESG assets around the world. So across the world, finance is changing. It's changing really fast. I mean, our work on the task force, but the IFRS, the, the global accounting body, and this is probably the single most um, influential piece that can, can happen. They're creating a, a, a sustainability standards board. Big announcement earlier this, this week. 
Um, we've got the EU with its taxonomies and, and its, uh, its reporting system coming along. The UK with sustainability disclosure requirements for businesses and investors. The task force uh, on climate-related financial disclosures. I can't tell you, uh, every day there's a new acronym in this field and I have to just read them out properly so that I don't get them, get them wrong. Um, but this is, you know, this is a really, really powerful opportunity because accounting is unavoidable. Every business, every investor you know, is, a, is, uh, is subject to accounting. If we include in accounting you know, in a, in a single global system, not just the financial, but also the positive and negative of the impact of their work, we have changed the world. It's a very powerful opportunity. You're already part of this, this opportunity. You're taking it up. The, the changes that, that are needed are going to be a struggle in some countries. And we really have to think about how, you know, most of the needs are in emerging economies. Most of the, the power is in in the developed uh, economies. But, you know, we're seeing things uh, come in a very different way now. I, I was talking recently to a, an African investor um, who said, you know, just forget the best practice. Everybody talks to you about doing best practice. We need to create completely new practice. We need to uh, reboot uh, our economies, um, build it anew. It's time to, to think wider. It's time to think, to act more broadly. You know, we all know the urgency. We all know how important this is. Um, impact accounting for all investments, we believe, is going to be the kind of change that we need. A financial system which can genuinely, truly fit for people and planet. Thanks very much for everything that you do. Thank you, Cliff. So you heard it here first. We can rethink capitalism to serve society and the environment. Hurrah, that's what needs to happen. We are now going to hear from the Boot... I'm having trouble with Boot Camp this morning. Boot Camp host keynote. Um, David Dulaka, CEO Julius Barr. Oh, there you are. So glad you're here. Um, you're now going to make a pitch for the Boot Camp in six minutes or so. My goodness, that is quite a... That's quite an ask. A six-minute pitch for the boot camp. Um, uh, well, that's a, a challenge and a half. And I uh, have, like a number of people, been following COP, uh, and these past few days have indeed talked a lot about tipping points. And I think probably next week we will hear more about tipping points. Maybe we will have a few tipping points uh, this afternoon in the boot camp, uh, if you join us. Um, but the boot camp uh, focus is really on sustainable finance. And one of the biggest tipping points that we have seen in the financial services industry is one that has nothing to do with finance. It is all to do with trust. The great financial crisis has materially changed everything for our industry. And I represent, uh, as CEO of Judas Bear International, uh, the 130-year-old uh, pure wealth manager, the largest pure wealth manager globally. Uh, we operate around the world just looking after some of the wealthiest in, so in society. So why do I mention trust? Because something that really worries me starts with a trend that we have been seeing for a number of years uh, since the financial crisis, and that is that people are losing their confidence in my industry. Probably there are some people in this room that would argue exactly that. And a recent study indeed showed that 70% of millennials would rather go and see the dentist than talk to a banker. <laughs> Priorities are shifting. And I think the old adage of greed counts, profit above anything else, that is a, an adage that is long going. And if anything, trust has been eroded where those priorities have been forgotten. What we have seen is a change in priorities. And so similarly, uh, it is of no surprise to me that 95% of millennials now are interested in ESG investing and are two times more likely to invest in a company that has good ESG principles in it. These may be an up-and-coming generation. What about the established generation? Well, things are changing there too. 
Uh, again, studies show that 67% of high net worth investors, people with more than a million quid in the bank, 67% are increasingly interested in sustainable investing. And it is not just in climate, which clearly has focused so many of the headlines. Uh, another study shows that 47% uh, of those individuals are predominantly interested in the S of ESG, the social impact uh, of investments and the social impact of companies. People are sure looking, and they always will look for a positive financial return, but they do want to see that it is accompanied by a positive social impact. And that social impact, that societal impact, has to consider more than just simply finances. Values-based decision-making is of increasing importance, and that values-based decision-making is going to become more than just simply a niche for the converted, and I would probably argue that most of us in this room are converted already, it will become mainstream. It will become embedded in the thoughts and the priorities of almost every single person investing. What's leading that change? Yes, governments, governmental bodies. We've heard a lot about government pledges, whether they involve India or South, South Africa and coal promises. Uh, maybe their government bodies, the UN Principles for, for Responsible Investing, uh, established a number of years ago, nearly two and a half thousand companies, uh, most of them investment managers like Julius Baer, have signed up to those UN Principles for Responsible Investing. What's driving the change? Maybe it is regulators, uh, accounting bodies, as we have just heard, setting a new standard, a new series of expectation on the industry and on finance in general. Maybe they are driving um, uh, a change to, to tackle greenwashing, to make sure that people have confidence in what they're doing and confidence in the advice they receive. Maybe it comes through financing. And probably that is the expectation for those coming to the boot camp this afternoon. The financing holds all the answers. Um, indeed, green bonds have been around since 2007. And green bonds have proved immensely successful. But the gap is immense. Green bonds only account for 1% of the bond market globally. And the demand is unbeatable. The IPC says that 29 trillion is needed in order to finance the climate-related ask for emerging markets alone. And the International Energy Agency says that 13.5 trillion is needed by 2030 just for the energy sector. Well, green bond issuance last year only accounted for 350 billion. It is not going to go enough in order to be able to meet the needs of, uh, of that shift in climate expectation. The, the role of finance is important, but ultimately the role has to be taken up by the real economy. It is the real economy that drives that investment that is required. And sure, accelerators such as direct impact investing or private equity, they're important. They fuel innovation, they fuel disruption. They fuel that early um, investment in new technologies that will transform the sectors and drive a material change. But they are, I would argue, not, they are not the only people who need to be uh, responsible in the financial world. A large part of the business world is, 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 is in private hands. A large part of the business world um, finances largely through cash flows rather than outside investment. A large part of the business world, for instance, some of the largest oil producers are in state hands. They don't need private equity, nor do they need green bonds in order to change. But it is not all doom and gloom. There is a material shift at work, and that shift indeed has transformed two of the four major um, uh, contributors towards, uh, towards climate emissions. Uh, the shift towards renewable en energy sources and electric mobility. These two have now gone beyond a tipping point. I think beyond a point of no return. 
and we're seeing cheaper energy being provided through renewable means, and we're seeing uh, uh, that, that shift towards electric mobility faster than anybody could have possibly predicted. It leaves really two things remaining. One is cleaning up heavy, heavy industry, and the second is changing consumption. And the last is probably the hardest of all. Are we prepared to change our priorities as consumers? Are we prepared to shift our spending, our investment decisions, our priorities that comes to our future and our families' futures? The PM um, here was uh, uh, lambasted for a comment that was perhaps made off the cuff. A comment that said actually um, obsessing about plastic renewables was not really the priority. The priority was really how do we get rid of plastics in the first place. And yes, um, changing, recycling uh, is important. I don't think that that is the issue, but actually fundamental change has to come to how each of us in this room behaves. Our priorities have to change. So the role of finance in all of this, it is essential. It's critical. And yes, indeed, green bonds are a fundamental area in here. Yes, uh, private equity and direct impact investing, these are critical. But I would argue that it is deeper than that, and it is deeper than governmental bodies. It is deeper than standard setters in accountancy. It is deeper even uh, than, um, uh, than the uh, expectations that are placed on companies. It has to come down to each of us. And so that is one of the most extraordinary things about my role in a private bank, in that I meet these people who have the ability to change their own decisions and in their decisions change how the outcome is in the future. It will require each of us to have a greater societal conscience as well as an investment purpose. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, on that note, if any of you have got a pension... Do you know where that money is invested? And if any of you have got a mortgage, can you speak to the credentials of the person that's lending you the money? These are the things that we can all do um, to influence the system and influence the real economy. Thank you very much. So now we have two further pitches for the Finance Boot Camp by two co-hosts. Co they have five minutes each. Five minutes. And I might just come and sort of loiter here if you go over a little bit. Um, first up, first co-host pitch is from Michael Sheeran, Senior Advisor to the Bank of England. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's been an extraordinary morning, and you've heard from some very, very informed and talented people. And I think those of you that are interested in coming to the finance boot camp, we can help pull together a lot of what you heard today. So Dimitri talked really well about some of the economic drivers. And one of the things he was talking about was regulation. Well, regulation is not the sole answer, but it's, he got a really key element, and that's incentives. What are the incentives? Because you, you've been asked here to, to change your consumption, your behavior, but large businesses trying to understand what drives their incentives are very unique. So if you think about what is the primary problem or drive around climate change, it's carbon. There's a whole slew of other issues around plastics and things of that sort, but let's start with carbon. This glass here was made probably at a factory that possibly used coal to generate its energy. In economic terms, coal is a free-riding negative externality because it's not included in the cost of this glass. Think about that fancy word as nothing as bad stuff. Bad stuff is then this glass probably got put in a plastic crate that it didn't have a return policy on it. It got shipped in a diesel truck, which put all kinds of particles into the air, and a little girl in South London died because of those um, last year. So these, all these free-riding negative externalities are in the consumer products, in your home, in every part of the economy, and there are not any hard incentives for the real economy to change these. Now, my pitch 
is two. One is that we need to get incentives to get these out of the real economy. And my pitch for the boot camp is finance is what can help them do that. So if you're the company that makes this glass, you need to change your business model. And you change your business model through CapEx and R&D. You come up with how can I make this glass with either net zero or absolute zero carbon? How can I pack it? And the gentleman who was up here with the seaweed um, plastic put it in his container, put it into a hydrogen truck, and drive it. And incentives are absolutely clutch. Now, the IMF came out with a paper in June. I know it makes your eyes roll up, the IMF. But it was a very important paper. And they said, look, it, we need to put a carbon tax on large companies. So imagine every single company in the world, for every ton of carbon they generated, had to pay this year 15 bucks a ton, stepping up to about 130 a ton by 2030. The OECD says that's roughly the right number, the Bank of England does as well, and moving it. That's a real incentive. So if you're asking a banker who gives loans or underwrites um, acquisitions about a company, all of a sudden they're gonna add a new cost line because when you're trying to figure out what the cash flow is, you make your loans based on cash flow. Well, your cash flow is how much money you bring in, less your expenses. All of a sudden, you're going to have a line in your expenses for carbon. And you might even at some point have one for water, for plastic, and all of these other bad stuff or free riding negative externalities. By the way, remember that word. It's a real impressive one that's really key to this whole thing. How do we drive it? And my banking colleague here is looking at me going, yep. So if you have to go, and, and if you're doing this, it's, there's a group area of the, balance, of the cash flow statement called COGS, cost of goods sold. And so if you've got a line in your COGS that says carbon, and you know exactly how much the company generates a year, and they know how much it's going to cost them, when you s subtract that from their cash flow, you might have a negative company. That's how you influence change. Because in, you know, basically, incentives are both positive and negative. That's a good crack on the head. But right now, we don't have the ability to do incremental change. A lot of the stuff you heard at COP was fantastic and would have been perfect for COP 2000, well, let's even go back basically 1990. There wasn't a COP back then, by the way. That's what it is. That's an incremental change. We're past incremental change. So the only way you're going to change the companies is through finance. The real economy needs to have incentives to do it, and the banking industry and the finance industry need to provide them with the capital to do it. That is my pitch for the finance boot camp. Come and see us, and we'll try and figure out how to do that together. Great. Stay there. Stay there. Um, million dollar question. How far off are we from pricing in those externalities? So far off, it's not funny. And here's a dirty <laughs> little secret. Even if every single bank and investment fund said, we're going to do this, there's no place to put it because there are no green companies. There are no green industries. They haven't made enough. So really what we have to do is take those real economy companies on faith. The banks need to give them the CapEx money and the R&D money because there, you, can't, you can play games, but there are no net zero carbon portfolios right now. Anyone tells you that, they're lying. They're, they're playing games. They're using fake faux offsets, all that kind of stuff, because the real economy right now is just chucked full of free riding negative externalities. Oh, I knew you were going to say that. So <laughs> now, so now, now, no, we kind of need to just go up a little bit. Um, so what would be the first signal that we're starting to price in those externalities? Can you point to something that's emerging that gives you cause for a little more accelerated progress where yes, we get to yes. be? Yes, yes. Well, Cliff brought up one of them, and, and, and I think Nico did as well, and that's just me taking a look at the electric vehicle market. Five years ago, if I would have told you that General Motors was going to commit by 2030 to have a complete fleet of electric vehicles, Ford, um, Audi, Volta, yeah. you would have never thought that. So that's a visual one. But if you're trying to keep score here, keep your eyes on two things. One is coal, because that generates the most amount of carbon that goes into the air. And the other one is trees. So basically, if we're not shutting down and substituting, because we can't shut down coal plants and leave people without energy. So we need to do those renewables. So yeah. a lot of that money needs to go into renewables. So shut down coal and keep trees in the ground. Because if you don't do that, everything else, even the EVs, is moving deck chairs around on a sinking Titanic. Great, so rapid decarbonization, rapid carbon sequestration. But, last thing, positive <laughs> thing, 
All the opportunity here is the alpha opportunity of a lifetime, and that's what I love about this event, because you see the new economy yeah. today. And we need to price in that beta. Off you go. There you go. Oh, I don't know why I need that. Um, anyway, I've now got two microphones. Um, so the last pitch from the second co-host is Duncan Grierson, founder and CEO of Climate Invest. It's no, Duncan. It's not. Oh! It's not. It's not. It's, it's just what it says on here. It's Andrew Cocker <laughs> from Climate. Thanks. Uh, so Duncan sends his apologies. He's been up at COP, uh, otherwise known as the super spreader event for the last two days. And he got pinged by the track and trace app. So he's now self-isolating. So you've got yours truly uh, for the next four and a half minutes. So I'm Andrew Cocker. I'm the chief marketing officer at Climate. And uh, put very simply, for those of you that don't know, Climate launched about six months ago. It is an investment app that allows you to invest in a portfolio of companies that are all designed to um, combat climate change. So this isn't an ESG. This is a, about as far away as you can get from ESG. This is positive climate impact. So I've just gone... Uh, there we go. Okay, so what is the context? Everybody in this room knows the context. Uh, we're, we're living in a world where climate change is rapidly increasing. And alongside that, uh, this report from the British Medical Journal uh, just a few weeks ago uh, suggests that there is now a massive also rise of eco-anxiety. And it's starting with young people, but it's across every single demographic now. And what's uniting people is this, this need to get involved at a personal level because people are tired and fed up of the governments and the companies that aren't doing their jobs. So now people are looking around and saying, what can I actually do? Outside of changing my, uh, changing my car, putting solar panels on the roof, I need something else. And that's why uh, we've launched this business to look at climate impact investing. Now, there's a growing body of research. Uh, th this particular example here was from Nordea Bank uh, that suggests that uh, in Investing into climate impact areas uh, is 27 times more impactful than doing the normal behavioral changes that you are used to, uh, used to doing, whether it's plant-based diet, flying less, electric cars, etc. So that's, that's an enormous uh, disparity in what people currently believe, uh, which is a real opportunity for us. And indeed, it's not just a, a strong opportunity for um, impacting the climate, it's also a massive opportunity to impact your wallet because this quote here from Al Gore, combating climate change is not just your generation's life or death struggle, but also the single biggest investment opportunity in history. And that's because the companies that are operating uh, at the cutting edge, at the vanguard of, of all these incumbent industries are, are slowly but surely getting them out of the way and, and rising to the top. <coughs> Here's the elephant in the room. We've talked a lot about ESG uh, in, in the last few examples, in, in the last few presentations. And I, I'm afraid to say ES, ESG is part of the big problem here. So this, uh, this expose by The Economist recently looked at the top 20 ESG funds in the world. And in those top 20 ESG funds were 17 fossil fuel companies. <laughs> 17 gambling companies, booze, tobacco. So this is the real problem. People don't know what they're investing in. They're ticking a box thinking, I'm doing some good. I'm, I'm going I'm to put some money into an ESG fund, and all this bad stuff is lurking in there. Uh, so we think this really needs to change. Um, thankfully, the debate is starting to move on. And in the business press, we're starting to see more and more stories now appear. It's going to get into the mainstream press as well. Uh, sadly, there, there, is no, there is no vaccine for the climate change problem right now, but there is an antidote to ESG and the nonsense that is ESG, which is let's build a new category of climate impact investing. And let's be really, really transparent about what you have to do in order to be able to have a company that is classed as climate impact investing, because this is what people want. Now, uh, in the previous talk, we talked about you know, carbon, even in a glass of water. Carbon is absolutely everywhere, in our clothes, in our water, in, our, in the way we travel around the world. So climate has six different themes that we invest in, from smart mobility, clean technology, circular economy, food, um, clean energy, and clean water. And, and it's by investing into these six themes 
and explaining to people not only the financial impact and watching their finances going up, but also looking at their climate impact that they are having, that their friends are having, and that the whole community around climate is starting to have um, on, this, on this problem. Now, today's boot camp session, uh, what can we do on a personal level and as business, leader, uh, as business leaders, and how can behavioral science really help us make impact investing mainstream? That's the challenge that, um, that, that I'm going to work through with you guys in the, in the workshop. Uh, we did some recent research with YouGov, and it's, it's, it's kind of unsurprising in a way, but we asked people to rank out of all the things that they could do to personally impact climate change, how, how, where would they rank these items? And investing money in, in, uh, and using your own personal savings to um, invest in, in climate change impact was ranked the bottom. So we have a big disparity, but that is a massive opportunity. Only 3% understand this at the moment. Uh, so we're really excited to be at the, at the beginning of this, of this journey. Thanks very much for your time. I uh, look forward to meeting as many of you as possible in the workshops. Thank you.